Hello everyone, my name is Aditi Chetta and I'm the Youth Program Lead here at CoLabs um, and I'm super excited to welcome all of you to the second panel of the CoLearn Founder Speaker Series. So whether this is your first panel or if you're back from last week, we're really excited to have you um, and to bring everyone up to speed. Uh, this series is actually part of, a, of the CoLearn program. It's been built with the support of our friends at Western Economic Diversification Canada to help young people in Saskatchewan become tech founders and employees. So with this mission, we've created the speaker series to bring you four panels featuring incredible Saskatchewan based founders talking about their experiences, their failures and demystifying what it really takes to be a founder. So last week we had three founders who were current students and recent graduates talking about why they chose to build a startup, uh, what they were most excited for and most terrified of uh, in terms of being a founder and helped us understand why there is no better time than right now to be a founder. Um, and today we're really excited to bring you two founders who've had quite the journey in tech. They've gone from building their own startups to becoming high performing uh, high, high performers at scale ups. So if you're ready to know uh, why being a founder um, has gives you the experience that's second to none, then you're you're about to find out. So the format for today is quite simple. Um, we'll have our virtual fireside chat with our two panelists. Um, we'll do some audience Q&A, so make sure you use uh, the Q&A function in Zoom to submit your questions. And then I'll be back at the very end to give you insight into next week's panel and to give you a link to our special speaker series draw uh, for a $100 gift card. So with that, I'd like to welcome our wonderful moderator for today. He's the founder, uh, the co-founder of Townfolio, uh, Davey Lee. Hi. Gee, I didn't Hello. know there was a gift card at the end of this. There so is. You I'll have not to participate. Darn it. <laughs> um, All right, over to you, Davey. Awesome. Thanks, Aditi. Um, so yeah, I'm very excited to get this trampoline going. I think it's one of the most unique names I've seen for a webinar. So. Uh, but before we, I get to introducing um, our panelists, what I want to do is give you a quick background on me so you know who's basically moderating. Um, my name is Davey Lee. I'm co currently the co-founder of Townfolio, which is basically a data software that visualizes all kinds of data on the internet on cities in Canada and the US. Um, I also have to happen to be an alumni of Techstars, which is one of the top technology accelerators, accelerators in the world. And basically where they invest in your company and um, the best way I can think of putting it is you basically get paid to do three months of summer camp equivalent and you basically learn how to grow and start a tech business. Ton of fun, highly recommend. Um, from an educational perspective, I studied electrical engineering and economics at York University in Ontario, but to be frank, I only played, played video games and was a really, really bad student. So, but when I did graduate, I took a job as an engineer, which I hated for about a year and quit. Then I took a job in uh, international trade in Ireland. I did that for a bit, loved it. Then I realized I came back to Canada and wanted to do, want to make money. So I went to private equity. And then I said, screw money, it's not worth it. So I went to the nonprofit space and I started doing data analytics. And I did all of this before starting Townfolio. So what I want to highlight here is my background is a big squiggly line. And it's not as linear as you think. And uh, what I'm excited to share is like, I think you will hear some of the other panelists on, on what, when you hear the stories that have a very similar path as well. But enough about me. What I'm really excited to do is to really introduce our panelists here, Rick and Jackie. Um, both are very successful and have some very interesting stories to share. So I'll give a quick bio on Rick. Rick is a mechanical engineering and computer science graduate from the University of Saskatchewan. He also happens to be an alumni of the Next36 program, which we'll, we'll dwell into a bit during the session. And over his university career, he's been heavily involved in extracurricular activities like college-wide science and engineering exhibitions and participating in numerous engineering and public speaking competitions. So he comes from a family uh, from deep, with deep farming roots and has this big passion for agriculture and sustainability, which is if any of you are interested in this kind of stuff, just start asking questions because Rick's your guy. Um, he started multiple ag, ag tech companies, agricultural technology companies, and he's currently uh, the product design lead at FarmTrex, which is focused on developing precise agriculture uh, tech for, for, for farms of all sizes. That's Rick. Now we're moving on to Jackie. Jackie is a commerce graduate in management from the University of Saskatchewan. She also happens to be an alumni of the Next36 program. 
so am I. So I think they kind of did this on purpose by putting us three together. Uh, but during the program, she started uh, Triumph Mobile Rewards, which was a mobile loyalty program for small and medium-sized businesses. Uh, she's spoken at multiple events like TEDx, the Web Summit, and has been fortunate to represent Canada at various G8 and G20 uh, summits across the world. On top of that, she, all happen she also happens to be CBC's Future 40 Under 40. Currently, she's a Chief Strategy Officer at Vendasta, which is one of the big tech companies here in Saskatoon, uh, where they help agency partners like web design companies sell digital tools to local businesses. Um, so with that said, that's the introduction, and I'm very excited for all of you to get to know these two amazing people and really like learn about their careers prior to uh, they start prior to them starting a company and where they are today. And they're all both very unique. So um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll get uh, Jackie and Rick to show their cam themselves on camera right now. And, and I also will note, say hi to everybody. <laughs> what yeah. I also want to note is that um, if you guys have any questions at any time, I want you guys to open up the chat and just type your question in. Don't be shy. Uh, Al, one of our colleagues, uh, Alex, will be moderating the chat and they'll be uh, forwarding the questions to me and then I'll ask them at the Q&A session at the end. So I want you all just to type away and I'm going to remind you constantly about this. So how about we just get right into this thing, get started uh, with, with, the, with the questions. So from my understanding, uh, with a, that uh, a lot of our audience members apparently are currently students or actually are recent graduates of some sort. So what I was hoping was that our panelists could share, you know, what life was like for them at that time. You know, what were their interests? What did you study? You know, tell us about you before your tech career. And maybe I'll start with Rick on this question here. And uh, the floor is yours. Sure. Uh, thanks, Davey. Uh, I certainly had a very unique university experience. I, I decided to go into mechanical engineering because I was always interested in technology. Like I was one of the kids that would try to take apart all of my parents' appliances and figure out how they work and try to put them back together with varying degrees of success. But um, I, I found out pretty early on in my NECENG program that they were pretty light on a lot of the computer science components or computer science side of, of technology. So partway through my program, I decided to add a second degree in there simultaneously, uh, which certainly complicated a lot of things. <laughs> and I also found out that I was really interested in a lot of extracurriculars. So I was involved in a lot of different student teams, uh, different engineering and public speaking competitions, as you mentioned. Uh, I also decided to uh, enroll in the School of um, professional communicate or the school of professional development to take on a, a few extra communication courses and at the same time my dad and I were also working on a number of different technology side projects just uh, based on different things that we thought might be useful for for our own farm or for any different construction project that we were working on uh, so we decided to start a company to legitimize some of these these side projects um, and uh, eventually that would uh, morph into the, the company that I'm working on now but uh, I'll get that into that a little bit later. So basically it sounds like you're a really good student compared to me because all I did was play video games and watch anime but you sounded like you were studying two degrees, you were doing a ton of extracurriculars and you were doing startups on the side. Did you have any time <laughs> for yourself well the, the one thing was I wasn't a very good student I I probably had well below average grades but I, I think that I tried to make up for just because of all the other different things that I was doing on top of that that's awesome but you know what that's a great trait it's just it sounds like you have a ton of hustle right and I think for anyone who wants to like do entrepreneurship that's a, like a very important trait to have and it's great to hear that even when you're younger self you had that um, that's awesome. Um, wicked. Um, how about yourself, Jackie? How about, what were you like uh, back in the day when you were in school and what were your interests? What did you study? Rick makes us all feel like slackers. because I know. I, I feel <laughs> like. I was partying. Um, I, uh, so first university, I, uh, 
I played soccer. So I was there to just like kick, kick a few balls around and then uh, pass as long as I could. But I ended up tearing my, my ACL. And uh, so I was no longer playing on the Huskies team. So I had to find a plan B. And so wow. I, uh, I actually, after the first year of school, I decided to drop out and I went and traveled the world for uh, about 14 months. I lived in New York and Mexico, and then we went to Switzerland, big backpacked Europe, and then we went to Southeast Asia and basically would, would find, we, our strategy was we would land in a place, find a job and save up enough money to fly to the next place, <laughs> Give up enough money to fly to the next place. Um, so that was a wild adventure, but I think, I mean, everything happens for a reason. It, um, taught me the importance when I was serving in Mexico I got paid two dollars an hour um and it is that in pesos or is that in USD <laughs> that was in the so 20 pesos which okay. back then it was a better exchange than it is now um but the, the that you can kind of survive off off nothing but anyways long story short I was also <laughs> a terrible student so Davey you and I had that in common I actually got pulled over um the dean at the time of commerce said said to me you know jackie you've only got 10 years to finish this degree and, and your credits start to expire so you have to go through it all again so she's like basically like finish and get out and move on with your life so i was one of those people that got uh, distracted with extracurriculars as well like the next 36 and ended up getting involved in a government organization that you mentioned um, got to take part in the g8 and g20 summits which was really cool um, and kind of represent Canada. But then I learned through the government, no offense to any government folks on the, on this call, but if you really want to change the world, uh, you go into private sector and into tech. And so I basically took a sharp left turn. I had a semester left of school after um, finding or founding um, Triumph Mobile Rewards, decided that I needed a little bit of finance and accounting background, ended up with a management degree, and then graduated and found the next so, so you mentioned there was a defining moment that made you take a sharp left like what what was the, what was that for you that, made that you? was the next 36 that was I was okay. always sort of like yeah I think you know first of all I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up so I was like I'll go into commerce because it seems generic enough to be applied to anything um which hindsight I don't know if I would do that now <laughs> engineering routes like Rick but what I found um through the next 36 program is that um, the creative side in marketing is, is very helpful, but you need the foundational numbers, like just, you straight up need it for, in order to speak business and not, and not just finance and accounting numbers, but metrics, um, what traction looks like. It comes down to numbers and a lot, a lot of, a lot of tech, a lot of business is pattern recognition and numbers. And if you don't develop that literacy. You can get that through commerce. You can get that through engineering. You can get that through mathematics. But um, having a strong foundation in numbers is like a common foundation that everyone needs to develop. That's awesome to know. And I would also say, like, even if any of your, if the audience members or any of you are like, like in the arts or artistic, don't be intimidated by that because yeah. the numbers that you're not doing quantum physics or anything like that. You're, it's just basic mathematics, and most people are capable of doing it. And, if you can wiggle your way around that, you can mask yourself as a very high powered individual. So yeah. I don't feel intimidated by that at all. And just, I want to just make sure I, I come full circle in that because even though the numbers is the foundation, I think where most of innovation comes from is actually back over on the other side, which mm -hmm. is art and music and the things that you can't really form on a spreadsheet. So exactly. Okay, so then that actually brings me into my next big question here is like, you know, how did the both of you decide, you know, your time was better spent, you know, working on your own startup, rather than just finding a job straight out of university. And, and I asked this because like, I went down the job route myself for the first five years after graduation, you know, due to various circumstances, like, well, Asian parents. And, and I remember when I told them I wanted to start a business, my parents almost dropped their mouths. They're like, stunned. They're like, are you crazy? My wife literally almost threw a book out of my, out of the room and said, you know, WTF. Well played. Uh, that was so good. Maybe, you saved so that maybe, time. Yeah, I did actually. I'm not going to lie. That was planned. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, maybe what I, we can do is maybe we can start with Jackie here and see what, her decision make was from you know starting a business rather than finding a job and then we'll come to Rick after. 
Yeah, I don't know. So I'm going to try and think of, I don't know if I ever really ever thought of it as starting a business. It was always like, I always had a hustle and I never really thought of it as I'm the founder of a company. It was like, I was telling this story to someone yesterday. We were talking about, you know, how can we identify really good high potential hires? And the common attribute that I see is like some, they've had a hustle and that hustle could be a business or it could just be when I was younger, I would, if you guys remember those Kool-Aid stamps, you get points for Kool-Aid packages. I found this like one Sobeys found these like 10 point packages and I would cut them out and I'd send it in in the mail and get these underwater uh, digital cameras and I'd sell them on eBay. And it was like, that's not a business, but it was like a heck of a hustle when I was, you know, 11 years old or whatever, but it, and just multiple series of those things. And I never really thought um, I'm a, I'm a founder, you know, I never really thought I'm an entrepreneur. It was just sort of, uh, seeing an opportunity and, and doing something about it. And so even, even to this day, like I, you know, even asked to get on this panel, I'm like, I'm not, I'm not really a founder. I just like solving problems. And um, I think that the best entrepreneurs are those, there's such a rigid definition of what an entrepreneur is. Oh, they have to be the CEO and the founder and they have to have founded a company and incorporated it. It's like, no, that's not it at all. It's people who find a problem that's worth solving develop like massive empathy for those that need that problem solved and just walk through concrete to get it done. And that's, I think, you know, it's not about being a entrepreneur and wanting that CEO on your, on your <laughs> business card. It's about uh, deeply and passionately running after a problem that you really care about. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And it really boils down to hard work and just hustle. Right. And I think, I think anyone has those capabilities of, of going down that road and pursuing that. So those are excellent points I couldn't more than agree with. How about you, Rick? Uh, it's definitely gonna be hard to top an answer like uh, Jackie's, but um, I, I think I, I didn't even realize that I wanted to be an entrepreneur or founder until like well after I had found my first company. Um, but uh, I, I think I had kind of the unique benefit of having a father who was himself an entrepreneur and had started a couple companies on his own and having that kind of uh, role model in my life and kind of realizing that that was like a legitimate career option was something that that kind of played into what I would ultimately decide to do in the long term and like I think that's something that's kind of changed in our own culture especially with with programs like uh, co-learn and collabs uh, kind of showing what entrepreneurship is in our community and actually showing students and other youth that it's not that difficult to start your own company. It's just a matter of, of uh, identifying a problem that you can be passionate about and actually just going all out to try to solve that and, uh, and seeing where that takes you. A hundred percent agree. Yeah. Yeah. And, and but, actually uh, it's, Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Rick. Oh, uh, no, I was just going to say that. Uh, yeah. At the same time, while not realizing that I was eventually going to want to go deeper into entrepreneurship, I knew that I wasn't the typical engineering student because every one of my peers was saying that they were looking forward to finding some oil and gas mining or consulting job. And that sounded like my own personal hell. And I was like, hey, there's got to be a different, <laughs> a, different, uh, a different end goal here for me. So um, I'm glad that my path has taken me where it has, at least. Oh, that's awesome. And it, it's great that you had parents that actually like were like, you know, encouraging you to, to, to look into down this path because it kind of, you grew up around in that. It's funny because like I grew up in, with parents who don't consider them some, 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 themselves entrepreneurs, but they started a Chinese restaurant in like a small town in Timmins, Ontario, hometown of Shania Twain, for those who don't know. Um, and um, they advised me to never go into entrepreneurship. They said, don't do it. It's like the worst thing you can do potentially for yourself at the time. But I didn't listen, obviously. And I, I think the, the results had been great for, for myself personally. And, and I don't want people to get scared by, by doing entrepreneurship. You don't just have to be an entrepreneur. It can just come in any form. So um, it, as long as you have the hustle and the hard work, it, it'll pay off. So, but um, what I'll do is I'll move on to the next questions here. But what I want to also say is just a reminder, everyone, if you have any questions, you know, just, just put them in the channel. I'm like going to get them right. 
and uh, it'll be Please, yeah, no Please. Limits. yeah, I don't want to get to this Q and A session and there's like no questions. <laughs> Um, but please put your questions in. If you, even if you want to share, like you know what your what your situation is, we're happy to give some advice on it as a as a question, why not? So don't be shy, right? Yeah. Um, so funny thing, like I, I kind of we kind of hinted at this earlier, but the one thing we all have in common here is that we all happen to be alumni of Next Canada, and and in my opinion, I think it's probably Canada's best accelerator incubator program there is in terms of learning how to start a business. Um, and I'm sure our panelists would agree with that. So maybe I was hoping maybe the both of you can, you know, share your experience about the program and how you ended up in the program and how you got there. So, and maybe we'll start with Rick on this one. Sure. Uh, well, I, I was pretty late to actually learn about what the next 36 is. I, um, <laughs> I was approached by one of my final year engineering professors, um, Sean Ma, who I think is actually in the audience right now. And he, um, he said that every year he usually has at least one student that he can kind of identify as being kind of of the serial entrepreneurial spirit. And despite the fact that I barely knew what that meant at the time, he, uh, he said that I should check out this program called Next 36 because he thought that I might be, uh, might be a good fit for it. Uh, so I, um, I said, why not? So I threw in my application and sure enough, a few weeks later, I, I was told that uh, I was shortlisted to, to try out for the program. So they invited me to their national selection weekend at the end of November. And um, not knowing what to expect, I, I reached out to a few other uh, Next36 alumni in, uh, in Saskatoon and ended up meeting up with um, Jackie's uh, husband, Jeff, uh, for coffee, who kind of told me about his own experience through the program. and and uh, I think got me in the right mindset of what what to expect during the selection weekend and what I could expect if I did get into the program. And um, yeah, it uh, it worked out really well that I got to the selection weekend and was just blown away by the the caliber of the people that this kind of program attracts. That every one of them is is incredibly talented, brilliant, and driven in in different ways and passionate about different. Um, different types of ideas and, and problems that they want to try to tackle. Um, and um, after a few days of, of interviews and getting to know everyone, they, they announced the, the people that they were getting into the program. And sure enough, I, I made the list. So I, uh, I um, kind of got myself ready to, to move out to Toronto for the following summer. And originally I was going to join up with another girl with her company, but uh, things didn't work out there, so I turned one of my final year capstone projects into a business and uh, and tried to make things go from there with varying different degrees of success. That's awesome. And would you say, like you mentioned, like the biggest thing you really enjoyed, Rick, was like the people. Would you say one of the biggest takeaways you got from there was just being around and surrounded by like-minded people and having the connections yeah. to today? Yeah, absolutely. Like I. I certainly learned a lot from the classes in the program and just kind of um, finding out what it's like to actually start a business on your own for the first time. Or I guess for me, it was the second time, but this was a very different type of business, I guess. Um, but by, by far, my favorite part of the program was just being surrounded by other people in a very similar scenario. They're, they're trying to get their businesses off the ground and sure, there'd be lots of triumphs that you would want to share with them, but there would also be a lot of low points and being able to... Um, to be there for other people while they're going through these problems or being able to kind of share your own problems with these people, I think went a long way to kind of make sure that you realize that you're not alone, that you're not a failure. It's just starting a business is really, really hard. Couldn't agree more. Um, so Jackie, I, I definitely think has a great story to share when it comes to the next thing, almost like a love story to some degree. Oh my God. But maybe we'll let Jackie speak to it. And <laughs> you would go that. there, Dave. <laughs> you would go there. Uh, for the record, let it be known that Jeff and I were already dating before the next 36. Everyone says, oh, you met Jake. No, we didn't. Um, so next 36, I'll, I'll back up the bus a little bit. So this is 2011. We were cohort number two. So we were still the guinea pigs on like, what is this thing gonna be? Um, but back then, and probably Rick and Davey, both of you, it, like, it's like a reality TV show. It is like a science experiment. It's so intense, so rewarding, um, but so intense. So back then, um, 
back then it was based on the individual, not on the venture. So they picked us as individual applicants. And I still remember Jeff saying, I'm, I'm applying for this thing. I'm like, what are you, what are you doing over there? And he's like, well, it's this, this, entrepreneurial institute you should really apply for it as well I'm like nah we won't no this is weird plus it would be weird if you got in and I didn't or vice versa blah 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 so like screw it let's do it so we both applied but we made one deal I'm really going deep here Davey you know, <laughs> go 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 it's a great the, start the participants <laughs> the audience the real deal um selection weekend the one condition was don't look at me don't talk to me. We don't know each other. So the whole week, we were the only two people from Saskatchewan. And they were like, hey, did you know there's another guy from Saskatchewan? I'm like, no, I didn't at all. <laughs> so I still remember that morning. Rick, you kind of glazed over it, but it's intense. Like selection weekend is nuts. It's like, you know, back to back, peppered interviews, like quick and rapid fire. What are those called? MM. MMR, not mixed martial arts, but um, anyways, like the series of medical interviews with, with experts. And then they, and back then they ended up giving us, um, uh, uh, you have to pitch, you got delegated your team at like 7 PM and you had to pitch the next morning at 7 AM to a group of venture capitalists in Toronto. You had to have pitch deck, you had to have prototype, like everything. So it was basically like an all night hackathon. So we showed up the next morning with zero sleep. And I still remember after this pitch event, they split us into two rooms and like half, 36 were upstairs, 36 were downstairs. And then Claudia walked in and said, half of you are going home today. I looked around <laughs> the room and I was like, am I in the same? And I saw Jeff, I'm like, either we're both in or we're both out. And we ended up making it. But yeah, I don't know what the original question was, Davey, but it was, uh, it was just, <laughs> exceptional experience sorry the the experience hands down the um one of the biggest trajectory changers in my career for sure it was um a pressure cooker of what entrepreneurship looks like you're surrounded by brilliant people from around canada you're paired with mentors who have been there and done that built rogers communications and have you know the general manager of facebook canada like really really high quality mentors and then the last thing was just the curriculum. They brought in people from Harvard, Wharton, MIT, um, you know, from all over Boston to teach you the economics of entrepreneurship, pricing strategies. Like it was a boot camp. And for anyone that's interested, I'd be so happy to tell you about the program because it was definitely a life changer. Absolutely. And you said it was one of the things that actually made you take a whole left turn and really go down. Like you, you thought entrepreneurship was your path after going through those three or four months of boot camp yeah, absolutely <laughs> for sure yeah absolutely and it's it you know i have to emphasize to everyone in the audience it is a great organization and even if you don't think you qualify you should apply regardless because it's just you just never know I, and like it's such a great program because i remember on my very last day you know i swear half the classes were in tears because it was ending and it was happy tears it wasn't like sad tears just happy tears and they were all sad because, you know, everyone was all going to go back to their respective cities and, you know, do their own thing. They're like, are we still going to be in touch? And to this day, I'm still in touch with a lot of my cohort members and I'm sure Jackie and Rick are as well. Yeah. And I think Definitely. the magic in that, Rick, you mentioned it, but it's about surrounding yourself with passionate, driven, like-minded people. And whether it's an X or six or here, like plug your, if you're interested in this stuff, I see a lot of familiar faces. So you're already plugged into the community for, but for those who are like, oh, I don't know what really, te I'm not a techie. I'm not in tech. None of us are really in tech. We just happen to work in this space. Right. So there are communities you can plug yourself into to have these types of conversations like collabs right here in Saskatoon. Exactly. Which, which if you aren't involved in collabs now, get involved. Um, <laughs> so again, if any of you have questions about next Canada or collabs, uh, please put them in the, the chat. I will uh, get uh, go into that right away. Um, so how about in our next question here, um, now that we know the backgrounds of, of, of both Jackie and Rick here, I was hoping maybe you guys can explain, you know, what you both do today as a career and how your experience that you, you got as a founder or the skills you picked up as a founder contributed to your roles today. And then we'll start with Jackie. Okay, sure. So um, 
Yeah, so I'm CSO at Vendasta. What, uh, what does that mean? Um, I kind of wear two hats. So as Chief Strategy Officer, I work with Brendan and the rest of our executive team at sort of shaping what do the next three years look like and what are some of the um, kind of the next big things that we can start testing uh, now. Um, but more recently, way more of my time has been spent uh, in what's called our small cloud broker, our mid-market division. So I see Stephanie on the line, so hi, Stephanie. Uh, Stephanie's one of our engineering managers. And so that division, we basically segment out our enterprise clients and then basically everyone else um, that doesn't fit into the enterprise customer cohort. And we have found really nice product market fit with that group of customers. And so it's really less about um, finding that fit, more about accelerating what we have there. And so last year we ended with about 90 people in that group. Um, this year we're going to hit 200. So we're, we're like exploding. We're finding some really brilliant people to help us um, find new customers in that segment. And the cool thing is um, we're growing with what's called a sales led tactic. So um, a lot of people through sales and marketing and then and customer success to help grow those customers. But from an R and D perspective and a product perspective, we're doubling down on a strategy that many of you are probably familiar with called product led growth. And what that means is um, the product leads the customer's experience. So if you think about like Netflix, you, you wouldn't fill out a form on Netflix to get a presentation from someone in sales saying, here's Netflix against Hulu, against Disney. And like, this is why Netflix is better. And you would just go and sign up and experience Netflix. So that self-driven, self-serve journey um, is, is, seems like a no-brainer when you've started from the ground up in that. But when you take a massive, robust enterprise platform, um, that has a lot of bells and whistles. We're really just simplifying it, creating a way better user experience and um, allowing someone to self-serve. And we're using things like uh, an academy for self-driven learning, a community for peer-to-peer um, -peer support um, and sort of employing viral loops, which is really kind of exciting and something I'm, I'm learning every day and, and brown new too as well. well. That makes a lot of, that's a super interesting. So like in terms of like what you learned from your previous startup, how does, how does those skills apply to what you've done uh, currently at Vendasta then? Yeah, I think, I mean, the previous startup, the, the beauty of starting a startup is that you don't, you're small enough to take risk. And as you grow in a big company, um, that appetite for risk uh, gets really, really scary. And that's how big companies stop innovating and like get disrupted, right? And so I think the, the beauty of having that startup experience is um, you, you start to get good at um, validation, I guess, is, is what you'd call it, which is how do you know when something is worth going forward with and when something isn't and when to switch course and testing and running, you know, when we're still trying to get better at experiments, but really using more than just your gut to say, this is the right way forward. Um, but rather throwing more of a controlled, let's, let's try it like this and see where it goes rather than arguing and letting perfect get in the way of progress. As we say, um, you just try it in a very limited scope and then you can roll out a sweeping change once you've, you're validated and you're never a hundred percent sure. Um, but the beauty about being an entrepreneur and having a risk tolerance is that, you know, you're confident, in making the decision before you have perfect information. Because as soon as you have perfect information, the opportunity is gone. So you have to be confident with taking a leap before you know really that there's kind of a ledge on the other side. Absolutely, and I, I couldn't agree more. It's just being able to take some risks and be able to validate it quickly. Um, how about yourself, Rick? Um, you know, what you, quickly what you do today and some of the skills you picked up as a founder to that are being applied to what you do today. Uh, so I'm the product design lead at FarmTracks slash True, which is mostly a made up title because I wear or also wear a lot of hats just like Jackie. Uh, so I, I lead up our mobile development team. I do all of our mechanical designing. I co-write a lot of our grant applications. I am involved in all of our special development projects. Uh, and I work very closely with our, our CEO and CTO about kind of a lot of our future business planning of where we want to take this company and, and what projects we actually want to take on in the future. Um, we're, uh, we're still kind of in that transition period between kind of startup and scale up. Like we're, we're only a team of about 18 people right now, but uh, we're 
kind of on track to be hiring probably another 12 to 18 people over the next uh, 12 months. So we're, we're going to be growing pretty quickly, which is, is pretty exciting. But um, it's, uh, it's certainly been kind of an interesting journey so far going from a project that my dad and I kind of conceived of in our in our basement to uh, to something that's actually now being used on on farms all across the world and um, and uh, yeah I I guess it's it's a uh, hard to really define what, what my primary role is because it's kind of just a little bit of everything which is I guess kind of where I'd like to be in the sense that I kind of like being able to do uh, do a, a lot of different things which I guess you kind of do need to do in a startup to kind of make sure that wherever there's need needs to be a body and sometimes that just needs to be filled by you. And that's probably one of the best skills too you learn is just being dynamic, you know, being able to switch into multiple roles and not be intimidated by it. And anyone who ever, ever considers entrepreneurship, I think it's probably the most valuable skills and you can see it in the application of both Jackie and Rick here. So um, for those who are curious, you know, I encourage you to ask more questions right now in, in the chat. So I guess before we jump into the Q&A, what I would like to do is to get both of our panelists here to, to basically give our audience members some advice to someone, you know, thinking about starting a company, right? You know, what can I do to, you know, to plan and get started t today or tomorrow or with it whenever? So maybe we'll start with Rick on this one and, you know, offer some advice to our lovely guests here. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, I think, the number one thing is, I don't know, just always be curious and always challenge different uh, different ideas and and uh, the status quo. That um, there's almost always a better way for things to be done. So anytime that you might come across something that you're frustrated with, like chances are other people are too. So that might be an opportunity for you to actually um, start a business trying to make that uh, that better. But uh, kind of on the other side of that, you should definitely find something that you're actually passionate about that uh, you can spend I don't know all of your mental and uh, and physical time on without without burning out because money can only motivate you so far so finding something that's going to keep you going um, when you are or aren't being paid is what's going to allow you to eventually find success in that way um, certainly surround yourself with with people who believe in your vision and uh, also make sure that if you are trying to develop something new, like validate it as much as possible. Like there's no such thing as too much customer feedback, just making sure that uh, what you're trying to build will actually resonate with the people that you're actually trying to sell it with. Absolutely, couldn't agree more. And I think that's some fantastic advice. How about yourself, Jackie? Yeah, um, man, where to take this on? A couple of things. So I would say, assuming some of the people in the audience are still in school, um, I would say find out how to develop hard skills right now um, and then go back to the real world and understand how to apply those skills from a different lens. So I'll, I'll, I saw a question in there and I don't know if we're going to answer it, but I'm going to answer it right now. So sorry, but it, it relates to this. So what the question was, can good students be good entrepreneurs as well? And I think the answer is absolutely. Um, but I think there's the type of student that understands the game of grades and knows how to play that game. And then there's the type of student, which is really a student I became after I had gone out in the real world and tried to start up, which was, holy sh crap, there's a lot of stuff I need to learn. And when I came back to school, it was way more about I didn't care about the mark. It was like, how do I apply what I just learned out there with this project I'm tackling right now? Because the grade I get is really just point in time, but the knowledge I grasp in doing this project and deeply understanding what went into this project is, is way different. Um, so mature students get an opportunity to learn this, but I would say, you know, it doesn't need to be this necessarily mature students is like really experience school and dive deep and don't get fixated on the grades, get fixated on how you're going to apply that after. And it might mean doing things like an internship or dropping out of school, oops, for a semester or two to, to try things and get a grasp of that. Um, the second thing I'd say is just don't, don't fall in love. If you're going to be an entrepreneur, don't fall in love with the idea of being an entrepreneur because you'll fail. Like I'll tell you right now, if, you, if you're doing it to become an entrepreneur, you'll fail. Um, so many people get 
fixated on building a company that they forget that it's actually about building a business. And you need to really figure out what that business is before you create the logo and build the company and do the website and everything. It's about starting with the problem and solve that problem really early. Um, and the last regret is that I didn't learn technical things. And I know that not everyone needs to be a coder, but you need to have, like, I wish I learned like even Google analytics or like SQL or just little bite-sized things. There's so, there's never been a better time to learn because there's so much available out there for you to learn and having just baseline you know, fluency and being able to talk about certain things or understanding the foundation of what, what is entrepreneurship um, is available to you now and develop those skills now because, uh, because you can and it's available. Yeah, and, and just to touch on that to the audience, like there's a big trend now like with no code startups basically, which I'm starting to see. And it's the emphasis like code's becoming a commoditized product now. You don't have to be technical to start a business right now. You can spin up so many uh, companies now with no code, just piecing together all the products you see online to create yeah. a business. And I've had some friends uh, do that and they've had some, some success to that. So, and I couldn't agree more with both our panelists here. It is, it is, is an interesting journey to do, to start a startup, but I don't think anyone should be deterred. And even if you're a good student, you're probably better suited it than, than I, than I was as, as a bad student. <laughs> so. oh, yeah, totally. But uh, with that said, what I'm going to start doing now is I'm going to start uh, bringing in some of the questions here that some of our panelists, our audience members have, have shared with us and, and get our panelists to answer them. So um, one of the questions here that, uh, that came in is, what has been the role of failure in your careers? And do you find that non-entrepreneurs see failure as a bad thing? So... Um, you can, both of you can try to tackle this or one of you, but maybe one of you might want to take a stab at it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I am certainly no stranger to failure. I failed my, my fair share of calculus class as well in university, but um, um, I, think, I think the big difference between maybe entrepreneurs or people who want to be entrepreneurs and, and everyone else is that a lot of entrepreneurs maybe see failure as a learning opportunity more than an actual failure that as long as you can uh can actually piece together like why you failed and what you can do better to make sure that that doesn't happen again and kind of pick yourself up and and keep going is is what's gonna kind of make sure that you don't see failure as as an absolute dead stop it's just kind of a way to stumble learn how to do better and move on Absolutely. Jackie, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I would just add exactly what, what Rick said. I was just trying to find the video. I watched a really good, very <laughs> quick video. Um, I can't find it, but I'll send it out to you guys. Um, but if anyone's heard of the, the theory, there's fixed mindset and growth mindset. And I'm, I'm, it's odd. I'm trying this even with my toddler right now. But someone with a fixed <laughs> mindset thinks that sort of the end is the end. And um, someone who, with a growth mindset um, they separate themselves from the situation and they see that not as themselves, but as um, the current blocker and that there's always a path that they're always seeing themselves as um, getting better and doing better. Um, and so I think true entrepreneurs, they all have that in common is they have the, they have the growth mindset and they're always, they never see failure truly as failure. It might be a failure at this point in time, but it's always, as Rick mentioned, just a stepping stone to the next, the next thing. Absolutely. And the best way I like to visualize it, it is think of it a, like a, a, a linear line that goes up slowly, except it's not as linear. It's a bit like wiggly in between, but the general trajectory is up. Yeah. You got to look at the trend. Totally. You got to look at the trend, right? So it's like when your stocks go up, you want that to continue going up, they go up and down every day. <laughs> um, another question that came in here was, um, what are some characteristics or traits do you believe are most crucial for a non-technical founder? Maybe I want both of you to answer this because Rick has a technical eye, but I want Jackie to maybe start it off first because she does come from a non-technical background. Yeah, I think lately that like, I mean, we've been hiring a lot of people lately and I think the great hires that we've made, um, 
and this is, I, I say hires, it, it applies to entrepreneurs as well. I, I don't think people value communication enough. The ability to, and, and I see the, the brilliant people in our organization and in collabs are those that can take a seemingly very complex topic and whether it's through imagery or words or I don't know, song, dance, folklore, they can break it apart into simple chunks and they're able to communicate a vision that people understand. So I guess to, to put that in another way, I, I would say um, there's a, huge, a tremendous amount of value. The world's complex. It's made up of multiple systems, all with different things happening all at once. But if you can, and I don't think it needs to be a technical mind that does this, this is actually where a lot of my role in the art is in diagrams. It's like building systems chart, building things that people are like, oh, okay, that, boom, I can go forward with that. That's a skill that they don't really teach anywhere. It's sort of like this art meets science thing. Um, and people who can communicate effectively, I think, are those that it's kind of like this weird skill. I don't know. Absolutely. And I agree. Communication is probably one of the most interesting, difficult skills that I've seen. But if you can communicate well, then that doesn't matter what you do. Uh, yeah. It's easy to convey your message. Um, so Rick, I know you're a bit more on the technical side here. So it'd be actually interesting to hear from your perspective, like some of the things that you see uh, non-technical founders may struggle with. Um, that we'll struggle with? Or, or not struggle with, or some traits that you believe are most crucial. <laughs> yeah. That, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, certainly as Jackie mentioned, communication is, is absolutely key. And um, I think that's that goes internally and externally that you want to be able to make sure that you can externally convey like what your business is ultimately trying to, to convey to to investors who might want to, um, to contribute to your business as well as to, to potential customers of why what you're doing is valuable to them. Um, on the flip side of that, internal communication and, and organization, I think is, is also pretty, pretty crucial in the sense that it's, it's uh, pretty important to make sure that everyone within the company believes in, in your vision and can understand what you're ultimately trying to, to build. Uh, and then on top of that, making sure that you actually stay organized and, and on task to, to make sure you meet your deadlines and uh, that your, your, uh, your scope doesn't creep too, too far so you actually um, can actually deliver the product that customers actually want and deliver it on time as opposed to trying to just build things for the sake of building things. Um, yeah. I think that's, that's probably the, the biggest thing, but. Uh. Absolutely. And, and that makes a lot of sense. And I'm technical, technical myself. And I mean, um, the one thing I've seen some of the most important traits from my non-technical co-founder is his communication ability. Um, but one of the things I do think that is really good that he has um, is the ability to, to, to learn and try to understand the limitations of the technology too. So um, I think, that is really important for any non-technical founder just to know like I have a dream I have an idea what are the boundaries I need to work within from a technology perspective that can make my idea a reality yeah and I'm not saying you need to learn to code or anything you just need to know like just some lines that's it and I think too with that Davey part of that is like the art of prioritization mm -hmm. and that is either technical or non-technical like what is the most valuable slice Mm -hmm. either be it in product development or where you spend your time in your day. Like I think so many founders get bogged down by their inboxes and their slacks and like they just go for emails and like that is, if that's what's dictating your priority, your priorities are wrong. You need to ruthlessly prioritize your time. And that is, that's an art. Absolutely. Um, I think we'll move on to our next question now. And it's an, it's an interesting one. Um, when balancing class, extracurricular activities, and your own projects, how did you balance your time and not take on too much at one time? Um, I'm very interested to hear because I struggle with this today. <laughs> but uh, I'll, uh, maybe we'll get Rick to start this one. <laughs> yeah, um, certainly while I was in school, this was a trial and error effort that I uh, 
many, many times found myself just taking on too, too much and, and underestimating kind of how much of a time commitment a lot of these things would, would end up being. And, uh, and sure enough, um, there'd be too much on the plate and things were bound to, to fall apart. But um, it's, I think that there's, there's certainly a lot of different ways that you'll eventually learn. And there's probably books you can probably, or YouTube videos that you can try to find to, to actually understand what things you do need to prioritize and how to better budget your time. Um, kind of Jackie touched on it a little bit already about just focusing on what, what things are important and, and not getting bogged down by, by, uh, by certain things. And um, I know, understand your own limitation. Like, yeah, you might be interested in everything, but you, you certainly can't do everything if you want to be able to do things well, because um, I've, Kind of found out throughout the course of of my my educational and and uh, post university career that um, I can do a few things pretty well or I can do a lot of things poorly. So just trying to figure out how you want to strike that balance is is uh, something that you'll have to just kind of learn over time, I guess. Absolutely. Um, how about yourself, Jackie? Um, I'll try and just summarize this. There's. Uh there's a lot of value in like agile principles. And if you've ever done like product development and road mapping, I would say identify what your boulders are. What are the big items that are most necessary uh, and that matter to you? So if it's good grades to get into a certain college or if it's whatever, like prioritize the big boulders first and then um, prioritize everything else after that. And all of a sudden, if you, if you pivot your day or your prioritization around the things that matter, things might fall through the cracks, but at least it's the sand and the pebbles falling through the cracks and you're never too busy to take on the boulders. So um, find out, I guess what, like do a roadmap, this sounds geeky, but do a road mapping exercise. Like where are you in five years? That's gonna help you determine what your boulders are. Everything else just sort of falls into place as long as you figure that out. If you don't do that long-term view of where you wanna be, you might prioritize an extracurricular over school when in reality that that school got you to where you wanted to be um, five years from now. And it, it is a hard thing regardless because sometimes great opportunities pop out in really inconvenient times. But be agile. Exactly. But be agile <laughs> and be dynamic and you'll make it work. Um, so, you know, that's something I think you don't have to worry about. Um, and then we'll have one more qu last question we, we got from the audience here. And I think it's a pretty good one. Um, early on in building a business, what is something that you put off doing earlier in the process that ended up being super important later on in the business? Um, I don't know who wants to tackle on first, but I, I'll share mine real quick. It was, you, it was, it was accounting, like bookkeeping. It, it sounds like a, a horrible thing, but I put that off really early on and it bit me in the butt like a year later when I actually had to file taxes and stuff like financially personally and like time like a lot of time because you end up playing a lot of catch up afterwards so if my recommendation for anyone starting a business just make sure you have your books in good order early on you'll save yourself a huge headache when you actually have to get serious <laughs> that's a good one that's <laughs> very important for CRA too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. You do not want the bills that come out after. Their interest is a lot. Um, uh, anyone else want to share one? <laughs> Rick, Jackie? Um, sure, mine, mine's maybe not quite as, as a big of a deal as the financial side of things, but um, as, uh, as the only mobile developer on our team for quite a while, I kind of rushed through things and or because of mostly deadlines and kind of skipped over documentation and many months or years later having to circle back and trying to understand that without any documentation definitely was uh, a lot of me cursing my past self for, for skipping over that so if you are involved in any of the the coding aspect make sure that you do properly document things because it's going to save your ass a lot a lot further down the line if you ever need to go back and revisit that oh yeah that's another one to add on my list too. <laughs> uh, Jackie, do you have any? Yeah, I think the first one comes to mind that, um, I don't know how to describe this, but something that I'm finding a lot at Vendasa right now is um, 
and I tell the collabs folks this, there's freedom in frameworks. There's freedom in frameworks. And what that means is if you think hard and do a lot of upfront work around a framework um, and you get buy-in across the team around that framework, it makes the individual decisions after that so much easier because you're applying it against a framework. So for example, when, when hiring a salesperson, we wanna do the scorecard, we don't make a decision based on an individual hire anymore. We apply it against a framework. And I think what it forces you to do in that um, is you, th you think about the problem holistically, not necessarily as a one-off and you do it in line with kind of the future of your company without having to be so rigid about today. I think a lot of people think of a problem. Well, we have to have this process buttoned up because tomorrow we might have this problem and this problem, and this problem. It's like, well, those are tomorrow problems. We'll figure that out. But as long as we agree today on how we arrive at that decision, um, we have to worry less or we get to worry less about the individual decision. So think about how you make decisions at a company early on. Um, and it'll set you free in the long run about making the individual decisions. And I think that's a really good point because, you know, speaking from experience, you know, when you're first starting out, you don't really think frameworks. You're just like build, 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 execute. Yeah. But frameworks come in real handy when you start adding people to your team because Shoot. they need to know what they're striving towards too. They can't read your mind. I've tried this. They can't. It's impossible. Yeah. But with a framework, they're able to, to work within their parameters of what they're given and really excel. And they'll probably excel better within that framework. And it's really easy when you're making positive. So one of the examples is we have leadership principles at Boston. And at first I was like, those are fluffy, whatever, like leads with ambiguity, all these things, like that's just fluff. But when you're making hiring and unfortunately firing decisions, if you apply it against the framework, you can coach someone and say, here's where you're falling down short. Not, oh, I think you're doing bad. It's like very, it becomes very objective and you can take sort of the emotion and it helps coach that person as well on. Um, so that's just one example of a framework around hiring. There's tons of frameworks, but it, it forces you to think about the problem holistically before the decision arrives that you have to make. And I think these points brought up are something all of you should really consider. And if you are able to somewhat avoid and put these in early, you'll, you'll be a lot, in a much better position later in the business. Um, there is one more question I, I do want to get through to the audience before we wrap, the, wrap up the Q&A. But the question is, which one do you think is more important for a successful startup? Idea or execution? Uh, and I'll let one of you tackle it first. <laughs> it, it's a tough one. Like, maybe I'll just, I'll start with my mind. I, I think, I think execution, but I undervalue, I'm, I'm more of a, a, a do it type person. Uh, and I think the ideas are a dime in a dozen, but I do recognize ideas are important too. So. Yeah, I, I think I'd agree that um, there's a lot of ways to screw up um, a, a good idea, but even bad ideas can be executed to, to be successful businesses. <laughs> so yeah, I, I would choose option C, <laughs> which, is, which is team. Because honestly, if you have an A team and a B idea and they fumble, um, I know that loves cheating a little bit. Option C isn't an option, but I used to really think it was execution. Now it's, it's really about market size and validating whether that idea is worth investing in. And I think if you have an A team, you can execute an A idea. That's actually really true. Cause like when I was going through Techstars, um, I met the co-founder of Google Maps and he was basically telling us that Google Maps wasn't actually Google Maps at the beginning. It was like a real estate website embed tool. That's what it was. It was like a property management, like something way off. And then, um, be, but because he had such a great team uh, and when Google came around and put a ton of money into it, like it became what it is today, Google Maps. So yeah. Yeah. Um, it's it, any, anything's possible. So maybe C is the best answer. <laughs> But um, I, I guess with that said, um, I, don't, I don't have any other questions unless anyone else wants to have any questions, but I don't see any other questions right now uh, for, this, for this session. And I think what I'll do is Aditi is gonna have some final words to share. So I encourage you all to listen, but I, I, 
I'm, I'm going, I just want to say thank you for letting us have this time. And awesome. Aditi, take over. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Uh, a huge virtual round of applause for Jackie, Rick, and Davey.